Ms. Cunningham, you may call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls criminalist Brandon Stepanski. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Please state your name for the record and spell both your first and your last name. My name is Brandon Stepanski, B-R-A-N-D-E-N, -E last name S-T-E-P-A-N-S-K-I. Mr. Stepanski, where are you employed? I work at the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations Crime Lab. How long have you been employed with the DCI Laboratory? I've been working since 2019. Describe your educational background. I obtained a Bachelor's of Science in both Biochemistry and Molecular and Cellular Biology from the University of Arizona, and then I went on to get my Master's in Chemistry from the University of Utah. When did you complete your formal education? In 2016. Um, and then upon completing your formal education, is that when you began your career with the DCI? Uh, there was a moment where I was a research assistant, and then I went on to the DCI. All right. Now define what your title is at the DCI laboratory. I am a criminalist, which means we receive evidence, perform our analysis, write the reports, and then as uh, requested, um, testify. Are there a number of different units within the DCI laboratory who do various types of testing and or analysis? Yes. Which unit are you assigned to? I am a dual role, so I am both in drug chemistry and the trace and arson section. For purposes of this trial, are we going to be talking about your responsibilities within the trace unit of the DCI laboratory? Yes. Now, what type of work do you do in the area of trace analysis? So I am um, trained in general unknowns and low explosives. And can you repeat the last portion of that statement? I'm general unknowns and what was the other portion? Uh Low explosives. Low explosives. All right. Describe the training that you received when you began your career with the DCI to do some type of trace analysis. Okay. So in, in trace, we're trained by the module. So each module will have approximately a three to four months training program, which um, includes uh, literature review, uh, mentorship, uh, practicals, and then finally proficiency and competency tests. Okay. Were you involved in an investigation here in Davenport, Iowa, which originated as the result of a report of a child named Riesia Terrell who was reported missing on July 10th of 2020? Yes, um, but the subject was not known when the, when the assignment came in. Certainly. Um, uh, when did your assignment come in um, that would have involved tasks that you perform related to this investigation? Um, when it exactly came in? Yeah. You? Would it have been after March 22nd of 2021 when her remains were reco um, recovered? Yes. It was. All right. And then what de details were provided to you, um, Ray, um, I'm going to call it the deceased individual before we knew who she was? So we get a receipt form that has a request on it um, for trace analysis, and then we have the items listed. So I had the item descriptions as described by the um, officer that uh, submitted the evidence. Okay. What items were submitted for testing? There were um, three items of clothing and two items that were plastic bottles or remnants of a plastic bottle. All right. Can you identify the clothing items that you received for analysis? I, I can. What were those items? Uh, item one was a shirt. Um, item two was, and can, may I refer to my notes? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, let me just do this, and this will make it easier. Um, I'm laying a foundation for purposes of a, um, discussing a report that you submitted. But Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 56. May I approach? You may. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 56 for purposes of identification. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 56? 
Yes. How do you recognize States Exhibit 56? I recognize the case number. I recognize the report of with my name on it, and it has my signature on the following page. All right, let's just go through and we'll lay the foundation and then we'll discuss the items that you received. All right, at the top of the document, how is it captioned? Um, the official report of Iowa Department of Public Safety, DCI Criminal Six Laboratory. Is there a laboratory case number that is affixed to this document? Yes. Is this a, a number that the DCI laboratory specifically assigns when they receive items for testing um, uh, from a particular law enforcement agency? Yes. Um, for the um, items that were submitted related to the investigation of Briasia Terrell, what laboratory case number was um, uh, assigned? Lab case number 2020-16859. And then is there a report number so we know which report this was in a series of reports that had been generated? Yes. What report number is this? Eight. What date did you generate this report? August 30th, 2021. And then do you indicate the type of report it is? Yes. Um, what type of report? Trace analysis. Does your name appear then on the um, back of that document as the criminalist who did the testing in this particular instance? Yes. All right. Your Honor, at this time the state would move to introduce state's exhibit number 56. I have no objection. Exhibit 56 will be uh, admitted. All right. Your Honor, may I publish this exhibit as we talk about it? You may. Okay. Okay. Mr. Stepanski, um, going back to the items that were submitted to you for analysis, um, were there more than one submission date? Or was there more than one submission date? Yes. Okay, what was our first submission date? Uh, March 25th, 2021. What items did you receive for analysis? I received three clothing items, um, lab items one, two, and three which would be a shirt, shorts, and bra, respectively. And then what was the second submission date? March 26, 2021. And then what items did you receive there? Uh, two items labeled lab item 13 and lab item 16. 13 was one white plastic bottle, and 16 was pieces of a broken white plastic bottle. Now for the March 25th submission, where did those items of evidence come from? Um, the agency says the DCI. Uh, well, no. Who was the individual that had um, brought those items to the DCI lab for testing? Um, on the report it says Rick Ron. Look at March 25th of 2021 and read right next to that. Oh, apologies. Um, Jennifer Pullen with the DCI, or er, for March 25th would be Mark Bethel, the medical examiner. All right. So the shirt, shorts, and bra came from the state medical examiner's office. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And then for our submission date of March 26th of 2021, who was the individual then that would have um, uh, um, uh, provided those items to the DCI lab for testing? It's, uh, Jennifer Pullen with the DCI. Are you familiar with Jennifer Pullen? Yes. How are you familiar with Jennifer Pullen? She's a coworker. Um, and um, as far as you understand, does Jennifer Poland work on the um, um, evidence response team? That's what I'm going to call it, but essentially the crime scene team that would go out and assist law enforcement in the processing of various crime scenes. Yes. All right. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's been marked as state's exhibit um, number 60, which was previously introduced. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 60. I'm going to give you a moment to look at that report so that you have a perspective of what it consists of. Okay. Um, who is the author of that report? Anna Young and Jennifer Pullen. When you look at the laboratory case number that's assigned to that particular report, is that the same report number that we have on your exhibit? Yes. All right. Now, we've had discussions throughout the course of trial about 
um, bleach bottles that were recovered or white plastic bottles that were recovered as well as um, uh, products of bleach that were being purchased. I want to make it definitively clear um, as to um, where the items came from that you received that were the white plastic bottle and remnants. Now as you look at the report of Anna Young and Jennifer Pollan, do you see descriptors for a um, white plastic beach bottle, or I should say a white plastic bottle? Yes. And then do you also see descriptors for pieces of a broken white plastic bottle? Yes. What is the laboratory number that Ms. Young and Ms. Poland have for the white plastic bottle in their report? 13. And what is the lab item number that um, the report of Ms. Young and Ms. Poland have for the pieces of a broken white plastic bottle? 16. All right. And so are those items the same items that you would have received? Yes. Okay. What was the nature of the request that was made of the trace unit for these items of evidence? It was a uh, trace miscellaneous analysis request, um, specifically requesting a bleach, looking for bleach. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about bleach. Um, when um, you consider bleach, um, are there different um, elemental compounds to various bleach products? Yes. Explain. So there's two, generally there's two different categories of bleach. Um, there's the chlorine-based bleach and then there's the oxygen-based bleach. Um, what is the difference between the chlorine-based bleach versus the oxygen-based bleach? Their active ingredient. The active ingredient for the chlorine contains chlorine compounds, and then for oxygen, they contain oxygen containing compounds. All right. Now, if you um, are asked to look for the presence of um, bleach on a product, how would you go about that process? So, we have a variety of different tests that we can do, um, both instrumental and using color tests and pH tests and stuff like that. Um, so, we develop a strategy for each individual item and then we will to our best ability and to the um, scientific standards um, then go through each one of those steps. Okay. When these items um, were provided to you in the trace unit, what request specifically was made of you? I'm sorry, can you repeat? What request was made of you relative uh, to these items? Were um, you to be looking for bleach? Yes, specifically. Uh, all right. So then go ahead and then just walk us through those. Well, first of all, let's talk about um, you formulated a plan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, explain what that entails and what decisions were made relative to the testing that you did. So um, we look at the item. I look at the items one by one. Um, and for each item, I consider what the matrix is. So in this case, for item one, it was um, clothing. So I have to come up with a plan to either analyze the clothing itself or to extract chemical compounds from the clothing and then perform analysis on those extractions. Um, from there, I would determine which instruments or uh, scientific techniques I want to use first, considering which are destructive and which are not. Um, and, and then I work through the scientific process. Okay. And then explain to us what you mean when you say you make a determination about the approach to take, um, depending upon whether um, a particular approach is destructive or not destructive. Um, so some, some um, testing will consume whatever you're testing. Um, so there's no, there's no getting it back. So you want to be careful with how much you use and, and in particular leaving some for further testing in the future. Okay. For the um, shirt, shorts, and bra, and I'm just um, lumping this into a general category, but was clothing items recovered <coughs> with the remains also submitted to the DNA section of the laboratory for analysis? Yes. Was that something that you were aware of? Yes. And so then when you were developing a strategy, is that something that you had to consider? Yes. All right. And um, that being said, um, when you were examining the shirt, what decision did you make in terms of the approach that you were going to take? So I, I examined the shirt visually first, looking for any signs that might indicate um, an oxidizer or a bleach were present. 
Um, and then I chose, based on my observations visually, which would be the most likely to contain bleach. Um, so I, I chose spots that would be representative of, of the sample. Okay, so as you looked at the shirt visually, did you see sections in the fabric that suggested that there was um, a product applied to it that had created the oxidation? So I will say I noticed lightening of color or discoloration of the shirt. I, I cannot say what that came from. Um, Certainly. But there was discoloration that I noted in my notes. Um, in the areas where you noted the discoloration then, um, uh, did you cut samples of the fabric away or how did you approach that? Yes, I cut samples, representative samples. Okay, and then once you chose your representative examples, what was the next step in the process? So I, the first step was um, the x-ray analysis. Um, it's non-destructive, so I could take the actual cutting and then um, perform an x-ray on it, which would give elemental data. So it would tell me what kind of elements are in um, the sample. Okay. Now before we discuss further um, what is involved in your x-ray analysis, let's talk about bleach itself, whether it's a chlorine-based product or an oxygen-based product. Um, is there... Um, um, circumstances under which um, the, these products, whether it be chlorine-based based or oxygen-based, that um, there are circumstances that will cause that to break down so that you would not be able to identify its presence through any analysis that you've performed? Yeah, um, bleach is capable of, of breaking down. Um, it's also um, soluble in, in water um, and susceptible to elements, different right. elements. So if this particular shirt um, had been um, outdoors, um, subject to the elements of nature, whether it be summer, fall, winter, and spring, with just the different varying um, weathering conditions, um, under those circumstances, is it going to make it very difficult to determine whether or not there had been bleach applied to this shirt? Your Honor? I don't think it's leading at all. It's like, would it be difficult? Overruled. Yes, I would, I would say the longer a sample is out in the elements, um, it would be more difficult or less likely to um, find evidence of, of certain compounds. You know. Certainly. So then let's go back to our discussion about the x-ray analysis. Walk us through that process. So the x-ray is a machine um, that shoots certain forms of energy at the sample and then depending on how it absorbs and then re-releases that energy, it gives us information about what elements are in that sample. Um, it's non-destructive um, and it will give us basic elemental data. So that means does it have, in this case, chlorine and it does it have metals, magnesium. Um, gives us that sort of information. Okay. When you performed the x-ray analysis on the sections of the shirt that you had cut away, describe what you noted. Um, if I may refer to my notes so I get it correct. Your Honor, may the witness um, refer to his notes? He may. So for, the, I, for item one, I took three different cuttings. Um, for each of the cuttings, the primary elements that I found were silicon, calcium, aluminum, and iron. There are very trace, very small amounts of chlorine in each of the items. Okay, all right. Um, then... Having said that, so there were trace elements of chlorine. Having noted that there were trace elements of chlorine, then um, can you take that next step or make that next step to say, say that those um, elements were in fact bleach? No. Okay. And then help us understand um, what more you would need if you're identifying chlorine-based elements, um, what um, is the difficulty that was presented where you can't then definitively say that it was bleach? 
So I'll be I'll be careful with my wording um, sure. because I am typically unable to identify bleach in general. I would be able to give a chemical and physical comparison that would be um, consistent with a chemical. All right. Um, however, in this case um, and in all cases, my analysis will the conclusion will be a culmination of all of my testing in general, not not just one item. Very rarely does one uh, testing indicate something conclusively. Um, so it would be a culmination of all of the testing I did and then at the end of it be able to rule out everything else and say this is consistent with particularly this and there's no other explanations. Um, so that would be the difficulty in um, saying it's consistent with and saying I couldn't find one way or the other. Thank you. But at least um, at the x-ray analysis stage you did identify, um, are, are we calling those chemicals? Elements. Elements. You did identify um, um, elements um, that um, are consistent with chlorine. Yes. All right. What's our next step? Uh, so then I, I took an extraction of the sample. So that just means I took, um, in this case, water. I rinsed the, the cuttings. And then I took that, that extract, is what we call it, and I tested the pH of it. All right. All right. Explain the import of pH when you're testing the pH balance um, of any type of, um, you know, I, I guess, extraction that you've been able to make from fabric. Okay. Um, so when I say pH, I'm referring to, like, the acidity or the basicity of, of a compound. Um, so when you think of that, you think, like, soaps on the basic side or, or acids on the acid side. Um, and uh, bleach is typically known as a basic solution, and I did, and I did take... Um, our, our known samples of bleach that we had in our laboratory and, and tested the pH along with it so I had a baseline of what to expect the pH to be of a basic of a, of a bleach solution. What did you note when you tested the pH um, pH balance? They were roughly around 7 which is uh, neutral or water. Okay and would that be consistent with bleach based products? No. No? Uh, so uh, sorry a bleach based product would be around a pH of 10. Okay, all right. And then so if a bleach-based product would be around a pH of 10, again, if we talk about um, articles of clothing that have been out in the um, um, elements um, for a significant, significant period of time, will that alter the pH balance? Yes, and, and to keep in mind that dilution also affects it. Okay, um, so all right. So I myself diluted it technically by extracting it, um, but it depends on how much bleach was there to begin with. So there are factors that influence what the pH would be. All right. Um, if a shirt was subjected to snow that has melted, would that affect the pH balance? Potentially. Um, if a shirt um, has been exposed to rain, is that going to affect the pH balance? Potentially. All right. Um, does sun have any, any impact on pH balance? Sorry, what? Does the sun have any impact on pH balance? Should not. Okay, so anything such as snow or rain, that would affect it? Yeah. I, I will um, correct myself a little bit. I suppose with taking into account the sun um, evaporating certain aqueous solutions or s solutions in general, that could affect pH. All right. All right. Then what was your next step? I went on to perform uh, color tests on the extracts. Okay. Um, what are you looking for in a color test if you are trying to determine um, the presence of bleach? Okay, uh, so there's a lot of color tests to perform. This one in particular is looking for oxidizing agents. So it is a certain chemical that changes color in the presence of certain oxidizing agents, which bleach generally has. Um, it also changes color in the, in the presence of nitrates. Um, which can be found in soil. Okay, all right. And then what did you determine when you performed those color tests? So on the first cutting, there was a very faint blue color change, which um, the positive uh, bleach sample that I used uh, changes to dark blue. Okay. So there was a light blue color change in one of the cuttings um, uh, comparing to a dark blue. All right. And if we go back to our earlier discussion, if that fabric has been out in um, uh, the elements where it's been subjected to snow and rain, um, uh, would that certainly impact it? Yes. Okay. What did you note next? 
So I then performed a infrared spectroscopy analysis on the sample. Um, so I dried down the water and then ran the instrument. And what did you note there? I was unable to get a very strong match. Um, these instruments results give you a spectra or a series of peaks and valleys sort of thing. Um, and uh, we compare it to a variety of reference samples and libraries. Um, I was unable to identify anything that matched strongly with, with the sample. All right, continue. That, that finished my analysis for that particular item. All right. Now, when we go um, to the second cutting, walk us through that second cutting and what you noted. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that was for all three of the cuttings. Oh, that um, was for all three. I, I, the only difference between any of them was with a color test. One of them turned light blue. The others have no change. I understand now. Thank you so much. All right. So um, uh, then, based on what you had noted, um, what did you report by way of findings? I was unable to identify bleach. All right. Um, but certainly in terms of just um, the varying findings that, um, uh, you know, you were able to establish, um, were there findings that um, would be consistent with the use of bleach if that fabric hadn't been submitted to the outdoor elements? And maybe that's not an appropriate way to say that, and you can correct me if you want to. So um, I'll explain it in a, so my, my conclusion states my, my scientific conclusion of all of this data, which takes into account um, the different elements that could possibly be in bleach and would be consistent with the chemical or physical um, components of bleach, but it also takes into account what kind of environment it was in and, and other environmental effects and, and ruling out everything else to say that this was definitively from this particular compound. In this case, um, due to the limited amount of, of sample or, or the diluted sample potentially um, and the fairly weak um, results for a lot of these samples, um, I can't say conclusively whether it was consistent with bleach or not because there are other elements that could be explaining these factors. Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, did you analyze um, uh, the shorts for the presence of bleach? I did not. Or the bra? I did not. Explain why not. So we, when we were coming up with the initial testing plan, um, we knew that these samples were going to be, um, they were, I guess, out in the environment for a very long time. We knew um, that it wasn't going to be a actual sample like liquid bleach. Um, and with our current instrumental and, and scientific um, capabilities, we knew it was going to be difficult to obtain data that would that would be consistent with for an identification or a comparison. So we developed a strategy in which we tried to find the most likely items being one of the clothing items, the shirt, and then the bottle that would um, presume to have maybe held a compound. Um, and with the um, results that we obtained, we did not think any further analysis would, would indicate any useful information. Thank you. I appreciate that. So then let's go ahead and let's go um, uh, down to the second submission. Um, uh, what was the strategy that was developed for the white plastic bottle and then the pieces of the broken white plastic bottle that came in? So I analyzed the whole plastic bottle with the idea that um, it would contain the chemicals longer potentially than a broken bottle it may have spilled and be open to the elements more. So I figured the intact plastic bottle would be um, protected from the elements more so than the other items. So I chose to analyze that item in particular. Um, Can I ask a question? When that white plastic bottle came in, did it have a lid on it or was there no lid associated with that container? There was no lid that, that I found. All right. And then um, my second question would be this. Um, was there any contents within the plastic bottle itself, or was it empty? There was what appeared to be soil and debris on the inside. Okay. All right. So walk us through that same discussion. So the same strategy applied to this bottle in terms of the scientific steps that I took. Um, the only difference being, instead of taking a cutting and an extraction, 
um, I rinsed the inside of the bottle with water and then continued on just like I did the previous item. Okay. Um, after you had rinsed um, the inside of the bottle and you were able to collect liquid from it, then um, did you analyze um, the water itself to determine whether or not there were any elements within it? Yes. Okay. What findings did you make? I apologize. The x-ray was um, not done on the water extract of the, the bottle. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. So um, what various tests did you perform? So um, outside of the x-ray, I did the um, pH test followed by the color test and then the infrared spectroscopy. Okay. What did you know during the pH test? It was around a pH of 7. All right. Um, what color? There was a light blue color and some fizzling. Okay. And then what do you mean by fizzling? It produced bubbles. Sure. Um, uh, does bleach produce bubbles? It can. Yes. Okay. All right. And then finally, with respect to the infrared petroscopy. Boy, spell that for our record. Okay. Uh, I N F R A R E D S P E C T R O S C O P Y. There we go. All right. And what were your findings there? Again, I was unable to find a strong match for any of our reference libraries. Did that conclude your involvement in this matter? Yes. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Waters. Mr. Stepanski, I'll just cut right to the chase. Every item that you looked at or tested and there was no bleach found on any of it, right? Correct. I was unable to come to a conclusion consistent with bleach. Okay, so no com compound consistent with bleach was found on any one of those items. Overall, yes. Yeah. I mean, your result says bleach could not be identified on the shirt or white plastic bottle, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, as part of your profession or your job, are you asked to try to identify bleach often? Not often. Perhaps other compounds? Cleaning supplies? Are, are you ever asked to do this? Yes. You've done it other than just this case, right? Yes. Okay. And the first time or the only time you were requested to test anything uh, in this case was March 25th and 26th of 2021. Uh, it looks like you didn't author your report until August 30th of 2021. Is that all sound correct? Yes. Okay. And at no point prior to March of 2021 were you asked to test any other item in this case, right? Correct. Okay, so those five items that we're looking at in this report are the only thing you were ever asked to test? Correct. Okay, and who, who requested these items? Is it just this Mark Bethel with the medical examiner? It, it appears there's two different um, submissions. So Mark Bethel would be the first submission of the three items, and then Jennifer Poland would be the following two items. Okay, so those two people, do they request this from your agency and this is assigned to you? Yes. Okay. And those two people never requested anything prior to March of 2021? From me, no. Okay. Anybody else in your agency? I would have to look at the assignments. Um, I know there were several assignments for this particular case. Okay. Are um, you the only person who was ever requested <coughs> to test for bleach? Yes. Okay. And you were asked a little bit about, you know, how the elements, sunlight, water, may, you know, dilute bleach. You remember that line of questioning? Yes. Uh, for example, I mean, you would expect a car, uh, you know, with its windows up to not be exposed by sunlight or water. Would you agree with that statement? Potentially water, sunlight through the windows maybe? Sure, but the point here is that nobody ever gave you like a cutting or a swab of, you know, fabric from a car, right? Correct. I mean, 
you weren't given any other piece of clothing from Mr. Dinkins himself or anybody else. Just I so wasn't. I'm very clear. I was only given the items of clothing that were in this report. Okay. <clears throat> That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Stepanski, um, relative to your findings, um, you did detect the presence of elements in the fabric that would be consistent with elements in bleach. Would that be fair to say? Yes, there were elements that could be found in bleach as well. Okay. And with respect to the pH balance test that you ran, you came up with a pH balance of 7. Correct. Bleach would have a pH balance of 10. Correct. Keeping How? in mind that water is 7, so neutral. Right. And certainly the extraction process would dilute the pH balance that you would have engaged in. Potentially it could. It's, yeah. it's a consideration. And then even being exposed to environmental factors can um, impact that pH balance, correct? Yes. And then finally, as for your findings on the color test, there was a light blue that was noted with bleach. It would have been a darker blue, correct? Correct. Um, I, I do want to specify, though, because we're getting into the specifics of my actual testing, um, that there are other explanations for these color changes and for the pH. Um, for example, the color change um, could be explained by nitrates, and there was the presence of soil um, on the items. Um, so I just want to be very clear that just because it changes colors does not indicate specifically that chemical. Certainly. Um, and then when you talk about the issue of nitrates, with the presence of nitrates, um, how would that impact the development of any color that you would see in the fabric? I, as far as I know, nitrates themselves would not ch change the color of the fabric. Uh, no, specifically what I meant is um, when you're performing a color test, how does the presence of nitrates um, impact results? Sorry, I misunderstood. Um, it would change the color to a blue. Okay, yeah. all right. So that's also a possibility as well. Yes. So we're looking at two, well, at least two possibilities with the color test. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And of course this search, um, shirt had been recovered um, outdoors and there was certainly dirt um, within the fabric itself. Yes. Okay, I have no further questions. I have not further. You may sit down. Your Honor, the state calls criminalist Mike Schmidt to the stand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please have a seat. Okay. Get some Please state your name for the record and spell both your first and your last name. Michael Nathan Schmidt. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-C-H-M-I-T. Okay. Mr. Schmidt, where are you employed? I work at the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation Criminalistics Laboratory in Ankeny, Iowa. What is your title there at the laboratory? I'm a criminalist. Okay. How long have you been employed at the DCI laboratory? 25 years. Which section of the laboratory are you assigned to? I'm assigned to the casework section of the DNA unit of the crime lab. And then do you do um, analysis on items for the presence of DNA then? Yes. 
Could you describe your educational background? I attended the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I received a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology with minors in chemistry and psychology. Okay. When did you complete your formal education? 1997. All right, and I'm doing the math, so then would you have started with a DCI after you concluded your formal education? I had a full-time job as a criminalist in the DNA section of the lab in June of 1998, and I've been there since then. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when you started with the DCI, <coughs> describe the training that you received. I had about six months of training by the senior criminalists in the DNA section of the crime lab. Uh, those were people that had been working there for... Uh, decades. Um, I was trained in the DNA analysis methods, uh, examining evidence for blood stains and semen stains. Um, and also I was sent to uh, a couple of uh, classes. Uh, one was at, at the company that manufactures the DNA kits that we use in the crime lab. Uh, they were in San Francisco, California at the time. I had a week-long course in PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, uh, DNA amplification and typing. Um, and I've had continuing education um, at least eight hours every year since then, with the exception of uh, 2001 when there were budget cuts. What is DNA? Uh, DNA is the building block of life. Um, it's found in the nucleus of every cell in your body that has a nucleus. Um, if you arrange it a certain way, uh, you, the end result is a tree. Um, if you arrange it a different way, you'll have a, a, an insect or, or even a human. Okay. Where do you find, or how do you examine items for the presence of DNA? Um, in the lab, um, with some evidence, you can see items that are stained, that have blood stains on them. Um, we look at a lot of blood stains in the crime lab. Uh, we also work a lot of sex assaults, and um, sometimes you can see semen stains with your naked eye, but a, a lot of times you can't. Uh, you have to use an alternate light source or a forensic light um, to help you visualize the stain. Um, and uh, we also uh, examine some items that um, might have your saliva on them. For example, in burglaries, uh, people leave cigarette butts or pop bottles or beer cans behind. Uh, we can swab the mouth area of those items and attempt to develop DNA profile from saliva or cells that are left behind on that item. Okay. Now, before we talk about the um, processing of items for the presence of DNA, um, first of all, educate us um, about where we get our DNA. Um, half of your DNA you get from your mother, and the other half you get from your father, your biological mother and father. Um, it's, it's passed down to you that way. Um, the sperm cell is going to have uh, half the DNA, half of your DNA, and in the egg that the mother has has the other half of the DNA. They come together, and you have the full 48 uh, set of chromosomes that uh, that make up your DNA. Okay. When you receive um, items in the laboratory to, to test for the presence of DNA, then um, how is it that you? Um, well, I say, well, let, let me do this. Let's talk about the steps that you take then to process DNA samples. Uh, first, I'll examine the actual item of evidence in the lab, um, basically looking for semen stains or, or blood stains most of the time. <clears throat> then I'll take a small cutting of that stain, uh, put that cutting in a small plastic test tube, and uh, add some chemicals to that, heat it up, and that breaks the cells open, releasing the DNA into a solution that we can use. Um, once I have the DNA into solution, I'll do what's called quantitation. And quantitation tells us how much DNA is there. Um, the testing we do right now at the lab requires a very specific amount of DNA, a target of approximately one nanogram of DNA. Um, so that's why we need to quantitate the samples before we uh, amplify the DNA that is there. Uh, the next step in the process is... And then can I ask a question relative to the topic of quantification? So if there is not a sufficient sample, then um, does the analysis essentially stop there? Um, once we start our DNA process, if we do do a quantitation, we usually carry it all the way through. Um, other crime labs in the country, uh, they will stop it um, if the quantitation is telling them there's not a sufficient amount or there's no DNA there. Uh, we are working towards developing that and, and implementing that, but we are not there yet. All right. All right. So then after the quantification stage, describe then what's involved in amplification. 
Amplification is, is taking the DNA that's there and making many copies of it. Uh, if you imagine a copy machine take, starting with one piece of paper and then you hit the copy button about a million times. So that's kind of what we're doing with the amplification process in DNA. Uh, we need enough DNA that can be detected by our analysis instrument. All right. And then once you've gone through the amplification process, then what's the next step before you start the um, process of comparison? Uh, we, we load the amplified DNA onto an analysis instrument, and that instrument measures differences in lengths of fragments of DNA. Um, basically, we're looking at 21 uh, different locations um, uh, in a person's DNA on, on their chromosomes, um, looking for DNA factors there. And uh, the instrument, it, most of the fragments are between 60 and 460 base pairs long. And there's a laser in the instrument that can measure differences uh, in length as the DNA travels through a capillary or a small glass tube and passes through the detection window where the laser shines on it and, and takes all the measurements for us. Now, Mr. Smith, speak to this particular topic. Recognizing that we get half of our DNA from our father and half of our DNA from our mother, I pose the question, is DNA unique to each of us as individuals? Uh, if, if you look at enough different locations, uh, most people are going to have a different DNA profile. The exception would be identical twins. They're going to have the exact same DNA profile. Okay. All right. And then once um, you have um, developed areas of the DNA to test, then how would you compare um, DNA of an individual to um, any locations of items of evidence um, for the presence of DNA to determine if there is a match. I will have a printout of the crime, the crime scene evidence, the DNA profile developed from a crime scene, and then I'll have uh, another piece of paper with a profile printed out of potential or alleged victims and suspects in cases, and I will do a side-by-side -side comparison to see if I can either match or make an elimination okay. between the samples. That being said, um, I want to direct your attention to um, a death investigation, um, specifically arising out of a report of a child identified as Briasia Terrell, who was reported missing um, in July of 2020, and then we had recovery of remains on March 22nd of 2021. Um, did um, Rick Ron of the um, Iowa DCI um, reach out to the DCI laboratory to, to assist in identifying skeletal remains that had been found um, and then collected on March 23rd of 2021 um, out north of Clinton, and I know you probably aren't aware of the area, but did he contact the DCI lab to help us identify um, who those remains belonged to? Yes. All right. Now, did you um, perform a number of different analysis um, after the recovery of those skeletal remains? Yes. Um, as far as your first involvement in this case, what were you tasked with? Um, uh, first, uh, the body had been found and um, they asked the, the DCI lab to assist in uh, the identification of the body. Uh, so the lab received a bone from the remains and uh, I was assigned with uh, trying to develop a DNA profile from that bone. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's been marked as States Exhibit 57. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm handing you what's been marked as States Exhibit 57 for purposes of identification. I'd like for you to look at that report and tell me if you recognize that report. Yes, this was the first DNA report I wrote for this case. Okay. How is that document captioned um, at the top in the middle? Official report of Iowa Department of Public Safety, DCI Criminalistics Laboratory. Is the lab case number attached to your report that was assigned to this investigation and submissions that came in to the DCI for analysis? Yes, the lab case number was 2020-16859. And as far as um, varying reports that were generated by the DCI, what report number is assigned to this report? Report 1. Um, what date did um, you complete your findings and author this report? March 30th, 2021. And does your report um, identify what type of report this is? Yes, this is a DNA report. And is your signature attached to this document as the criminalist who did the DNA analysis? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move to introduce State's Exhibit 57. No objection. 
Exhibit 57 will be admitted. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. All right. <clears throat> In looking at State's Exhibit 57, what we're doing, Mr. Schmidt, is just trying to give everybody a perspective of what came in so that we know what items of evidence that you were working with. Do you um, have three separate sections showing three different submissions that came in? Yes. All right. The first entry, give us the information as to date and what individual with what agency um, had submitted items and what those items consisted of. Okay, on March 25th of 2021, Mark Bethel with the State Medical Examiner's Office submitted a shirt, shorts, a bra, and a box containing a left femur bone. All right. For our next section, what was our um, submission date for the second um, item of evidence and who was responsible for that submission? On March 25th of 2021, Mark Bethel from the State Medical Examiner's Office uh, submitted an item containing tissue from the left leg. All right. And are we talking about the um, earlier submission of the box of left femur? Would that tissue have come from that? Uh, the tissue came from the left leg. Gotcha. Uh, it, it was in a, a small plastic test tube. Okay. And then for our third submission, what is the date... Who made that submission and what item was that? On March 26, 2021, Evan Obert with the Davenport Police Department uh, submitted the known buckle swab from Aisha Lankford. All right. Let's talk about the known buckle swab of Aisha Lankford. We're going to go back in our education so that we can set our perspective. Um, I would represent to you that Aisha Lankford is the mother of Briasia Torrell. Now, what is a buckle swab? A uh, buckle swab is uh, basically a cotton-tipped swab, uh, basically a Q-tip, except it just has cotton at one end of the swab, not both. Um, now, to get a known DNA sample from someone, uh, an officer, a detective, or a sheriff's deputy, will take that swab and rub it on the inside uh, of a person's mouth uh, against their cheek or their cheek wall. Um, there are a lot of cells present in that area, and uh, that's usually plenty of DNA for us that we can develop a DNA profile from that okay. swab. When the swab from Aisha Langford came into the DCI laboratory, did you, in fact, develop um, a, a DNA profile for Ms. Langford? Yes, I did. All right. Now, why did you need to develop a DNA profile from Ms. Langford? Um, in order to, to make a, a comparison uh, to the unidentified remains that were found in this case, um, we, we, there, we do have a DNA database that we have access to. Uh, it's a national DNA database, but it contains uh, DNA from crime scenes and convicted offenders. Um, we, I could, if, if, if we didn't know who the person's mom was, we had no idea who the body was, I could uh, put that the profile from the body into the database and see if there was a match somewhere. Um, but uh, most of the time, uh, we, we do ask for known samples from uh, the decedent's uh, possible parents or their children in order to make a comparison. Um, basically don't want uh, uh, an innocent person's DNA in the database if we don't have to, if we can make an identification in another way. Uh, and basically, children aren't going to be in our data DNA database. Certainly. And then, so then, did you um, take the tissue from the left leg and develop a DNA strand from that? Uh, I attempted to. Um, that I was unable to develop a DNA profile from the tissue sample from the okay. left leg. And then, can you explain why? Um, when a body is left out in the Iowa uh, and, and seasons pass, uh, that body is subjected to the extreme weather, um, sun, rain, snow, ice, wind, um, the heat. Uh, if, uh, if you ever find a dead bird in your yard when you're mowing the lawn, a couple days later it stinks really bad and, the, and it decomposes really fast. That's just the way Iowa weather is. Now in other places it's not like that. Like in Arizona in the desert, uh, the bodies dry out pretty quickly and are kind of preserved a lot better than they are here in the Midwest. Um, and so when bodies are subjected to those extreme conditions, the, uh, they decompose and then 
therefore the cells also decompose and the DNA in those cells degrades and eventually gets to the point where we can't uh, detect the DNA that's there because it's been either completely degraded, inhibited, or destroyed. Okay, so then does that take us to the left femur? Were you able to develop any DNA from the left femur? Yes, I was. All right, and describe. Um, I took a cutting from a, a section of the femur uh, from, a, from the adolescent doe and uh, was able to develop a, a DNA profile from that based on the comparison of the DNA profiles of adolescent doe and Aisha Lankford, adolescent doe could not be eliminated as a possible daughter of Aisha Lankford. The probability of kinship is 99.9998% as compared to randomly chosen, unrelated, untested, untested individuals. Okay. Now speak to the language that you've used in your report where you indicate that she could not be eliminated as a possible daughter. Um, and this is just um, uh, for sake of discussion. Um, let's assume for sake of discussion that Aisha Langford had three daughters. Um, uh, when you report this type of finding, um, what is the import of this type of finding if she were to have three daughters? Um. I would need uh, the other two daughters uh, to, to determine if she could be uh, included as a possible mother of those two daughters. Um, I, I can say that, that Aisha Langford is definitely included as a possible uh, mother of uh, the unidentified remains in this case. Okay. Were those findings then reported to the state medical examiner's office? Yes. And then so with that, since Aisha Langford was identified as um, a biological mother of this female child, would that then require the state medical examiner's office to obtain dental records to make a definitive determination as to who, which female child um, these skeletal remains were? Yes. Um, my role is to develop DNA profiles and do the comparisons and issue my report. Uh, in body identification cases, the medical examiner or state medical examiner has jurisdiction over the body. Um, they are the ones that ultimately make the identification decision. Even when we have a match in a database, we still issue our DNA report um, to the medical examiner and they decide uh, whether the body has been identified or not. Okay, let me go ahead and take that exhibit from you. And we'll go on to the discussion of our next report. How many reports in total did you author? Three for, for this case, um, two others on a, on a cross-referenced case. Okay, and we'll set the discussion aside for the cross-referenced case a little bit later on. We've had discussions about that, but as far as your second report, Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's been marked as State's Exhibit number 58. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit number 58 for purposes of identification. Do you recognize State's Exhibit number 58? Yes. How do you recognize State's Exhibit 58? Uh, this was a DNA report that I issued in, on April 19th of 2021. And in this report, what is it that you will be speaking to? Um, this was the shirt, shorts, and bra submitted uh, by Mark Bethel from the medical examiner's office. All right. Um, Your Honor, this, um, well, let me ask you this. What report number is this? Five. Does it bear the same lab case number? Yes. What date did you generate this report? April 19th of 2021. And again, does it identify the nature of the report that you authored? Yes, it's a DNA report. And does your signature appear at the back of the document as the criminalist who did this analysis and generated this report? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move to introduce State's Exhibit 58. No objection. Exhibit 58 will be admitted. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. All right. So as we look at State's Exhibit 58, then, um, are we simply focusing on the three items of evidence for that first submission that we saw in the earlier report? Yes. Okay. And for purposes of our written record, just establish that again. Uh, this was a, a shirt, shorts, and bra submitted by Mark Bethel from the medical examiner's office on March 25th, 2021. Okay. 
Now, describe um, the type of DNA analysis that you were doing on these articles of clothing. Um, these articles of clothing, I, I was screening uh, for evidence of uh, sperm or seminal fluid, um, basically sex abuse type evidence. Okay. Mr. Um, Schmidt, can you speak to um, the impact of environmental factors if, in fact, there was sperm or seminal fluid on an article of clothing that had been um, located outdoors over the course of multiple seasons? Um, the chances of me being able to develop a DNA profile from that type of item, uh, if it's left outside in Iowa weather for multiple seasons, uh, are pretty slim for me developing any kind of DNA profile from it. Uh, the reason I was able to identify or develop a profile from the bone for this case is because uh, the DNA um, is basically a lot more stable in bones, in bodies. Um, the, the, it's, the DNA is trapped in the crystallized calcium structure of the bone, and it takes a lot of uh, a lot of time, a lot of energy uh, to to release the DNA out of those crystallized, hardened, calcified bone cells. All right. Can you also speak to the topic of bleach? Um, how would bleach impact um, the ability to detect sperm or seminal fluid on an article of clothing if it was poured over that clothing? Um, bleach, it destroys DNA. Uh, we use a solution, 10% bleach in our lab to, to clean our work areas. Um, and that's just a 10% diluted bleach solution, but that's good enough to clean our working surfaces, to, to clean the surfaces of any DNA. That way we're not uh, contaminating items in between examinations. Okay, all right, so walk us through um, uh, your findings in this particular case. Um, I attempted testing on two stained areas uh, of the shirt. Um, I, both screening tests were negative for seminal fluid in those areas, and I did not find any sperm microscopically in either of, the, either of those samples. I attempted DNA analysis on the sperm and epithelial fractions uh, for both cuttings. I was unable to develop any DNA results from the shirt. I want to stop you right there. Now you have mentioned two terms. You talk about the sperm fraction. It's obvious, but define. Um, when we look at a, a sample that contains seminal fluid or possibly contains seminal fluid, we attempt to separate out uh, two different fractions from that sample. Uh, in the end result, we're going to have or attempt to have one tube that has DNA from skin cells or blood or or uh, saliva, and then in another tube we're going to have just the sperm cells or DNA from sperm cells that are there. Um, our lab calls those the sperm fraction and the epithelial fraction. Other forensic labs call those the forensic one fraction or F1 and the forensic two fraction or F2. Um, it's, it's just a naming thing. Um, just because I call the sperm fraction doesn't mean it contains sperm there, and that's probably why the other labs uh, call it an F1 fraction, because it doesn't always contain sperm. Okay, and so then that explains the difference between sperm fraction and the epithelial fraction? Yes. All right. Now, um, let's also speak to this term, um, uh, spermatozoa. Tell us what you mean by spermatozoa. Uh, sper spermatozoa is just a plural for sperm cells. Um, if there's just one sperm cell, then we'll, we'll call that a spermatozoon. Um, if there's two or more, then we will say spermatozoa. Okay, then let's go back and let's circle the wagons and start where we were um, at before I had you give us those definitions of a sperm fraction versus an epithelial fraction. Okay. Um, I was unable to develop uh, any DNA profiles from either the sperm or epithelial fractions of both samples from the shirt. Um, I also tested a stained area of the crotch liner of the shorts and a stained area from the seat area on the interior liner of the shorts. Uh, again, for those two samples, I, both of those samples screened negative for the presence of seminal fluid. I did not find any sperm in either of those samples, and I was unable to develop DNA profiles from the sperm or epithelial fractions of both samples. Okay. 
I want to make sure that we understand what you're saying. All right, when you say that you were unable to identify any sperm as being present, again, if clothing is out, doors and is subjected to the elements, will that destroy the sperm? It can. All right. So then when you say that you were unable to, to identify sperm, do we have to consider the environment within which um, those articles of clothing were located and what they had been subjected or exposed to? Yes. Okay. Continue. Um, I also examined uh, what, what a bra that was found in two pieces. Uh, I attempted DNA analysis on the interior cups of the bra. Uh, I also screened at the cuttings that I took from the cups of the bra. Uh, both of those screened negative for seminal fluid and no sperm were found in either sample. And then again, uh, I was unable to develop any DNA profiles from the sperm or epithelial fractions of both of the cup samples. Okay. Um, are these findings um, um, consistent with what you would expect to find if you had articles of clothing laying outdoors through a summer, fall, winter, and spring month? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about your third report that you generated. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what's been marked as States Exhibit 59. I'm handing you States Exhibit 59. Do you recognize States Exhibit 59? Yes. How do you recognize States Exhibit 59? Um, this was the DNA report uh, that I issued on July 29th of 2021. Okay. And again, does this contain the same lab case number that you previously referenced? Yes, 2020-16859. What report number is this? Seven. What date did you generate the report? July 29th of 2021. What type of report is this? This is a DNA report. And does your name appear on this document as the author? Yes. Your Honor, at this time the state would move to introduce state's exhibit number 59. No objection. Exhibit 59 will be admitted. Your Honor, again, may I publish? You may. What was the nature of the submission as noted in State's Exhibit 59. Uh, this was uh, an additional submission from Mark Bethel with the State Medical Examiner's Office. On June 30th, 2021, uh, Mark submitted fingernails, or apparent fingernails. Okay. Now, what type of fingernails did you say that he submitted? Did you say parent fingernails? I'm not sure that I understood you correctly. Yes. I. I couldn't determine if, if they were real fingernails or the fake uh, fingernails. Oh, I understand what you're saying. What was the nature of the request then that was made for the fingernails that had come from the state medical examiner's office? Um, just if I could develop any DNA profiles from the fingernails. Okay, and then describe what you um, were able to determine or not. I was unable to develop a DNA profile from the swabs of the fingernails. Okay, thank you. I'll go ahead and take that report from you. Okay. I'd like to set the stage for our, our um, further discussion. Now, um, were you asked to do DNA analysis um, on some um, items of evidence which would have included like a child's white medium tank top as a result of a um, murder that DCI agent Rick Ron was involved with. It was a collateral, invest well I shouldn't say collateral, a completely separate investigation from the investigation of Breasia Terrell. Yes, uh, there was a, a, a separate homicide from Clinton County uh, that the DCI was investigating. Okay. And I think what I'll do what's our last example? 
Your Honor, may I ask what our last exhibit number was, our highest exhibit number? It would be 156. 156, thank you. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing counsel what has been marked as State's Exhibit 157. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm handing you State's Exhibit number 157 for purposes of identification. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 157? Yes. How do you recognize State's Exhibit 157? Uh, this is a DNA report that I wrote January 21st of 2023. All right. What is the case number associated for this laboratory case number? Uh, the DCI lab case number for this case is 2020-17232. Is that a completely different lab case number as compared to the um, lab case number assigned to the Briasia Terrell case? Yes, it is. All right. All right. So then let's just go back. Um, for the Briasia Terrell's case, what was our lab case number again? 2020-16859. All right. Now, um, by virtue of that homicide that had occurred in Clinton, um, was the lab doing um, a, um, a number of different analysis based on submissions that came in through that case? Yes. Okay. Um, was some of the evidence collected in that um, investigation turned over to Davenport just to submit to see if there was any connection at all with this case? Yes. All right. Um, and then um, as we look at this, what date was this report generated again? January 21st of 2023. What type of report? A DNA report. Does your name appear as the criminalist on this report? Yes. And um, uh, does this set forth the listing of items that came in through Davenport asking you to test? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move to introduce state's exhibit number 157. No objection. Exhibit 157 will be admitted. Okay. May I publish, Your Honor? You may. All right. Now, I'm handing, or I, I'm putting forth state's exhibit 157 under the Elmo. If you could, let's again go back to the section of the report that gives us a date. <clears throat> who the submitting officer was, and a description of the items that came in. On November 28, 2022, A.J. Poirier with Davenport Police Department submitted a Hanes Crew Style white medium t-shirt, one children's white medium tank top, and some hairs sealed in tape. All right. If the body in this particular case was recovered on March 22nd or discovered on March 22nd of 2021, then this report was offered, authored when? January 21st of 2023. All right. And do you know when that particular homicide took place? Um, I do not. That's okay. Um, when these items came into the laboratory, what were you asked to do to see if it had any tire connection to the Briasia Terrell investigation? Uh, there were some small shirts, uh, child-sized shirts, so I, I was just asked to see if there was any DNA um, that could be uh, either eliminated or matched to uh, uh, Briasia Terrell and Henry Dinkins. Okay. Was there um, some type of blood or other bodily fluids on that child's t-shirt? Yes. What was it? Uh, there was blood on the child t-shirt in uh, three stained areas, uh, DCI item two. I was able to develop DNA profiles from uh, those areas. Uh, the DNA profile developed came from a male source. Um, and later on, Henry Dinkins was eliminated as the source of the DNA profile, and Briasia Terrell was also eliminated as the source of the DNA profile. And so the um, male source, how is he designated in this report? Uh, male A. <laughs> and has male A been identified to date as who the contributor would be 
no. um, for that blood on that child's t-shirt. No, he, he wasn't. Did that conclude your involvement in this matter? Yes. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Waters. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, you were asked a line of questions about uh, how the elements, you know, sunlight, rain, snow, whatever it may be, uh, is or has the ability to destroy uh, DNA. Do you remember that line of questioning? Yes. Okay. So you would agree then that those elements can destroy DNA, sperm, whatever it may be? Yes. Okay. Just as, isn't it just as explainable? Uh, that there was just never sperm or DNA on those shirts? Yes, I did not find sperm on yeah. those shirts, so that, that's a possibility, yes. Wouldn't that just be the easier explanation? Um, it, you could go either way on that. Uh, sure. there, there's no way for me to, to, to know that. I, I can only say that I didn't find anything there. Yeah, and that's fair. You know, I'm not trying to trip you up. But okay. then what we just talked about, those shirts... Uh, I think it was found from a, a black Challenger, a, a car, right? Do you remember that? It, it was found in, in a car. Okay. I know that. Um, and I think it was just maybe one shirt or two shirts. Two, two shirts. And was blood visible on those shirts? Stains were visible to me. It didn't look like blood, but it did screen positive for blood. Um, could have been vomit. Uh, we, we don't have a screening test for vomit. Um, it could have been diarrhea. There's just... All I can say is the, 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 the stain screen positive, the stain's screened positive for blood. Sure, and then your assignment with those items that we just looked at was simply to test or compare the, the DNA from male A to Henry Dinkins and Briasia Terrell. Am I understanding that correctly? That's right. Okay, at, at no other time did somebody request to look at any other person of interest other than Bereja Terrell and Henry Dinkins? No. Um, had I developed a, an unidentified male profile from um, Bereja's clothing, um, especially if it came from a sperm fraction or, or sperm DNA, and Henry Dinkins was eliminated, I would have put that profile into CODIS because there shouldn't be sperm on a child's clothing. That would at least be uh, an act of sex abuse. And so that profile would have been put into the database and would have eventually been compared to uh, suspects throughout the nation. Um, so it's, it, it's just that in this case, I was only given knowns from, from two people. Sure, and um, male A, we don't know who that is. That's right. Okay, that's all I have. Okay. Yes, thank you. Mr. Schmidt, um, do we also have to recognize that you didn't find Briasia's DNA on any of the articles of clothing? That's right. Okay, and I'm talking about the articles of clothing um, to include the shirt, shorts, and bra that were found out um, uh, in the elements um, uh, on March 23rd of 2021. Yes, I didn't find uh, her DNA on any of the clothes from either of the cases. Okay, and so under that circumstance, um, again, presumably if an individual is wearing clothing, um, is there going to be a transfer of our DNA on that clothing? Usually, yes. All right, and with those articles being out um, in the elements, um, does that help us to understand why you would not be able to identify any of Briasia's DNA on those articles of clothing? Yes. I have no further questions. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. You may sit down. Thank you. Your Honor, this um, is um, uh, all of the evidence that the state has to offer at this time. As we indicated yesterday, Detective Hamas would be our last witness, but she's going to take a significant period of time, we think. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I wouldn't, uh, is the uh, defense asking that we start at 9.30 again on Monday? Please, please. We will. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you.